and thanks on one for uh, opening up this platform for us to learn this is really cool uh, so what I want to talk to you about today is long exposure so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about long exposure for a little bit talk about Yosemite for a little bit and then go into an actual long exposure workflow with one of the images uh, from kind of the woodsy more the more woodsy areas of Yosemite so we recently went to Yosemite National Park and when you think about Yosemite you think about these uh, giant sweeping landscapes like you see here in tunnel view um, and, and every once in a while you see these little you know waterfalls kind of popping up here and there if you go at the right time so we went in May and luckily in May when we went uh, I guess Yosemite was seeing the most waterfalls uh, water in their falls in the last four years I mean some of these waterfalls were coming down so fast and so hard uh, that you couldn't be near them with your camera because your your all your gear would get drenched and soaked in a matter of seconds so it was one of those like uh, set the camera down take a shot wipe off your lens uh, move your camera get your settings back and then move your camera back and focus real quick and shoot I mean it was some of it was a chaotic nightmare and which is completely opposite of the last time I went to Yosemite about six years ago there was no water dumping from the waterfall so you could pretty much have free reign to shoot wherever you wanted to in front of these falls so what you're seeing in front of you here is this area called tunnel view and then over here on the left you've got El Capitan and back here you've got half dome I believe this up here is Sentinel Dome and then you got the three brothers kind of peeking out right here in Bridal Veil Falls and it's really just a gorgeous place uh, to shoot uh, up here this is more of one of those shots from um, up in the uh, Washburn Point area on your way to Glacier Point looking down at one of the falls over there onto the right hand side and you know just some beautiful beautiful images that you can create from the contrast that you see there in the granite that's coming from the uh, the rocks there and the rock formations and uh, here's when I went six years ago you can see that that was Bridal Veil Falls in this picture dumping water like crazy and then this one uh, not dumping really anything at all so uh, dramatic difference depending on the time that you go but you know it was really inspiring going there and and, and shooting some black and white uh, like like Ansel Adams uh, and just really being in the same places that he was in you know, gorgeous gorgeous spots but what I want to talk to you about is long exposure photography today so we'll jump out of the uh, the Yosemite talk for a second and go more into the long exposure talk so you know when we're looking at Yosemite there's a lot of waterfalls all over the place when you're looking at it from a landscape perspective and you're shooting it wide it almost doesn't really matter what your exposure is set to because those waterfalls are so far away but once you get into the woods of things and you're looking at some of the waterfalls that are in the woods uh, that's when the long exposure stuff is really important so in the park itself uh, when with those sweeping landscapes and stuff you know you can be cognizant of your exposure but really your exposure is not really set for the water it's actually being set for the landscapes that you're seeing so keep that in mind uh, so long exposure you know a lot of times I was just at a, a seminar and I heard someone say the long exposure you know just think of a long exposure as anything longer than a second uh, and I think that would be fine for you know maybe cityscape photography or uh, maybe some um, uh, maybe sports photography if you're really trying to capture those trails or something like that but uh, when you really think about long exposure photography you have to think about what it is that you're exposing for because sometimes the length of your exposure might not seem like a long exposure but because the thing that you're shooting is moving so fast it really is kind of a long exposure so you have to ask yourself the question what kind of personality am I trying to capture in this object that I'm shooting because if you look at this waterfall right here it's really uh, nothing glamorous it doesn't look glamorous right now because if you look at the exposure here if we go to the info here we're looking at one two hundredth of a second so if we if we zoom in we're almost kind of seeing some freeze frame uh, stuff happening in this waterfall uh, and, and it's not really capturing the personality of the water falling more of just a glimpse of the water as it's falling but then if we go to uh, let, let's say this one we're at one thirteenth of a second we're starting to slow down that water uh, and one thirteenth of a second you might not consider that a long exposure but look what happens now as we zoom in back here we're starting to get these really nice veins this, this vein work of water that's happening as it's dumping down the rocks and then if we go a little bit slower here we're at about 0.8 seconds uh, that again isn't encroaching on that one second it's really close to that one second but it's not quite one second but look at the character that's being captured in this waterfall now uh, and that's the thing you have to think about it's not necessarily the length of the exposure that you're using it's the personality of the subject that you're trying to capture 
And, you know, to some people, uh, this might be the way they want to capture waterfall, but I like to capture the instance of movement because that's what makes uh, flowing water in a long exposure just so uh, magical, I guess, you know. It kind of gets you in that, that mode because we don't see it like that. Um, our eyes can usually keep up with the flow of water. But then if we look at the, this waterfall, this is the uh, upper portion of Yosemite Falls. So you have the upper portion up here, and then here you have lower Yosemite Falls down here, and this big waterfall dumps into this little waterfall. But look at the shutter speed here. That's 1 320th of a second. So we're talking that's a pretty fast shutter speed for a landscape, right? But look at the look at the... The, the way the water falls off of these rocks back here now. You still get those veins, the vein work of something very similar to the waterfall before at a thirteenth of a second, but this is at one three hundred and twentieth of a second because this waterfall is dumping so much faster. It's dumping so much harder that uh, one three hundred and twentieth of a second could actually almost be considered a long exposure for this. Uh, but then if we were to maybe go with uh, a 3.2 second exposure on this, the waterfall turns into just a, a a mist. And there's some people actually like this look. I like to capture the personality of the water. In this image, you can actually see just how big and how, uh, how, how much volume of water is dumping with each second because of you can still see some of the texture that's going on in here. Uh, but then with this one, it's just one big foggy, milky mist. Uh, we can't really see the, the the character of the waterfall, but we do get a lot of character from the landscape because the waterfall almost becomes this white milky mist. So think about those things as you're photographing uh, long exposure images. Uh, are you doing this for the sake of uh, the, the whole image in front of you to capture the whole personality of the image in front of you, or are you doing, trying to do more of a self-study uh, on that area to, to really grab the personality of the waterfall? So sometimes you're going to have to, to, to justify your exposure based off of the speed of the object that you're shooting. As we saw here, this is 1 320th of a second, uh, and then this one is like 1 13th of a second, but it's almost the, the same speed, per se, of the water falling, but this water is falling much slower than that giant upper Yosemite fall. So then once you've kind of gathered your exposures for this and you're culling through your photographs and you're stopping and you're saying, okay, well, I kind of like this one because it's stopping the motion a little bit, but this one is so much more whimsical, uh, it's so much uh, more uh, magical because it's actually capturing each little uh, bit from the movement and the personality of that waterfall, then you have to get into the actual post-processing of the image. So for this one, I'm going to use one right here. This, this photograph was taken in Lewis Creek Falls, which if you're in the south gate portion of Yosemite, in the southern area of Yosemite, uh, more towards uh, the, uh, the base area there. There's a, I guess there's Oakhurst at the very base, and then as you're driving uh, north through Oakhurst, you're getting into the south portion of uh, Yosemite. And just in between Oakhurst and the gate to Yosemite, there is a place called Lewis Creek Falls. It's by a place called Fish Camp, and that's where our uh, our uh, workshop was staying, which was great because, uh, you know, if we if we maybe went into Yosemite uh, in the morning to catch the sunrise and then went back to our base camp to do some processing and talking and stuff, we had a place that we could always go to that was five minutes away to practice our waterfalls. So it was really a great location for us to do this. And, and the water that's dumping from here is some of the, the water that's moving uh, south from Yosemite. So it's a, it was a beautiful little spot, you know, a nice little hike, uh, and you had these little upper falls and lower falls that we could practice on and do, and do our work with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to first hop into Enhance to kind of talk a little bit about uh, the preliminary stuff that I do when I'm working on my images. And then after going into Enhance, I'm going to go into Effects and show you uh, how I really take this to the artistic level. Uh, we're going to do some things here that it's kind of like a doctor. Um, if you've ever broken... Uh, or let's, say, let's say fractured. Let's say you fractured uh, a bone really bad to the point that it wasn't really re re reparable by just uh, you know putting in a sling or something like that. Oftentimes the doctor will say, okay, brace for it. We're going to have to break it first, and then we'll get this casted up the right way. And we have to do the same thing with our images sometimes. So you're going to see me do some things here that you're probably going to say, whoa, like uh, pump the brakes a little bit. This HDR look isn't looking right for me. But that's fine because we have to break that arm and really uh, expose all the goods in there so that we can close some things down. So let's just go ahead and start off by jumping into Enhance. So I'm going to edit a copy of this image because it's a raw file, so we'll just go ahead and press OK, edit that copy. 
And Enhance is a good place to start because in here we're going to look at some of the things inside the waterfall that we can uh, keep protected throughout this process because a lot of the stuff that happens in our waterfalls, especially in, in this area of our waterfalls, happens in the highlights of our, of our image. So let me uh, see what's happening here. I'm getting some really bad blowouts there. Let me go back to browse real quick and see if I don't edit a copy. Let's just try and edit the actual image because I shouldn't be receiving those bad highlights right there. Okay, let me go back here. Okay. Just trying to find out why my highlights are blowing out so bad. You know, this stuff doesn't happen when you're actually working on the stuff beforehand. It usually happens when you're all prepped up, you're ready to go, and uh, and then you see it happening right here in your in your workflow. So that's not that's not fun. Okay. Let me see what's happening in those highlights. You know what? We can we can probably make this work. We'll we'll make this work from here. We'll be all right. Okay. So what I want to do is just look at the overall uh, image as a whole first and start talking about some things like with our highlights and our whites because our highlights and our whites are actually going to control a lot of what happens in the actual falling water area. So if you see these streams and stuff and you let's say you take an exposure a long exposure that you take that's a little bit too long. Uh, sometimes you can actually protect those areas pretty well uh, by moving our highlights to the left and and really bringing those highlights in and closing those highlights down and that, that creates some of that mist that happens from the water moving and takes that mist and it just uh, it cuts through it and allows you to see some of the contrast that's happening underneath that. So usually when I'm working on waterfall images one of the first things that I'm going to do is I'm just going to come right to these highlights and these whites and just going to uh, just cut right through them real quick just to see what my exposure looked like in those whites. You can see as I move this to the right to the left I can see how the contrast starts to come through underneath those highlights uh, and, and a lot of times when I'm doing the stuff that I'm doing with these images these long exposure images the, the, the one main thing that I'm trying to protect throughout the whole process to make sure it doesn't get hit too hard by some of my editing is those uh, streaky lines that I'm getting from the waterfall all right so I'm gonna go ahead and just drop those highlights down a little bit and that looks about right there let's, let's just keep that going we'll go all the way down with that because I like the contrast that's coming through there and then I'm just going to get my baseline. A lot of times if you ever hear me talk about uh, my workflow editing process, it's tone, it's color, and artistic effects. So what I'm doing now is basically modifying tone, uh, but I'm doing it in a very subtle way. So yeah, I'm just trying to open up my shadows a little bit so I can exploit some of that info in here and a lot of times we talk about um, the HDR process and a lot of the tone mapping that can happen and how nasty things happen with tone mapping and that's true to an extent uh, but when we when we just take a single exposure and we open up those highlights and those shadows it just gives us more dynamic range to exploit during our artistic process so from there I'm going to also look at my temperature of my of my whole photograph and just boost up my temperature just a little bit just to get that warmth back into the photo a little bit. One thing that you're going to notice especially in these areas of the water is that there's a lot of blue in that water and if we are actually there on the scene there's not a whole lot of blue that happens in our image. So I'm just going to boost up the warmth a little bit for now just boosted up to about you know the 70 or 80 point and that works about right for me and then look at the the overall tint of everything maybe just a little bit if you notice how I move my sliders I move them really fast I move them back and forth I've actually heard complaints about how I move my sliders before but you know what I'm doing is that my eye is actually seeing what it likes as I rapidly move that adjustment back and forth my eye starts to target areas that it really likes in the photograph uh, so that when I move this back and forth my eyes like oh no that green is horrible but if we tape, taper that down a little bit I can kind of get down on that green but then again I kind of like the look of the browns when I move this magenta over a little bit so take things to their extremes you can't hurt anything by moving a slider all the way up okay and from here I'm not going to do anything with my vignetting noise reduction or sharpening I'm happy with the way it is now I'm just gonna jump into effects and start building up my effects
So I talked about tone, uh, I'm also going to move more into tone, and then I'll start talking about color and then the artistic effects and how you can build this stuff up because uh, it's really magical when, when you get a workflow down that, that works for you. You know, I'm a big fan of not guessing about anything as I edit. Um, I don't like to say, oh, what would happen if I do this? I like to know beforehand exactly what's going to happen before I do something. So I've got my workflow down to this tone, color, artistic effects, and I don't care if you're in Photoshop, uh, Lightroom, Enhance, um, effects, it doesn't matter what plug, program, plug-in, or anything that you're, you're working in, if you think about tone, you think about color, and you think about artistic effects, and you target each one of those areas individually in that order, you're always going to have a workflow that you don't have to guess about anything in. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. As I said before, I do want to exploit the dynamic range in this image. So I'm going to go and add a filter and I'm going to hit the HDR look. Now I've noticed lately that less and less am I doing uh, actual tone mapping with my images because I, I just recently picked up a Sony and man it does some great things in that little A7R2 that, that are really quite impressive uh, with the sensor. So with the sensor being as, as strong as it is I don't have to tone map or worry about tone mapping quite as much. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at what happens when I do this HDR look on my image because I'm trying to exploit that dynamic range. I'm trying to open up my highlights, open up my shadows really well uh, and, and dig into them after I've opened up those highlights and those shadows really well. And again, I'm really not sure what's happening with these highlights up here. Um, if you look at the before and after image, uh, I'll show you at the end of this, if you look at the actual before and after image, I was not having the problem with those highlight blowouts. So uh, that's something that I'm going to have to look at because I'm using the actual same raw file that I was using before. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to boost up the compression here a little bit just to open up the, the, uh, the shadows and the highlights a little bit here and then open up that detail a little bit too. Uh, and there's really no, um, hey, put it at this uh, point because if it, at this point everything's going to look great. You can't just say uh, this number and this number or, or go to Surreal or go to Glow or hit a preset because this really comes down to uh, your personal taste on the image and, and every image is different too. So we're also going to boost down those highlights a little bit, just push down those highlights a little bit here too, and then maybe uh, look at our shadows here and maybe drop those shadows down a little bit, close those out a little bit. I think the vibrance and the glow and the grunge are okay. So if we look at our before, uh, really what we did here was we just brought out some of our, uh, our the tone, uh, the difference between our, our uh, highlights and our shadows, and, and push those around a little bit. So now what I'm going to do is after I've done the HDR look, uh, I'm going to close that down and I'm going to add another filter and do uh, a tone enhancer. And with that tone enhancer, my target now is to actually close some of those areas of uh, highlight and shadow down a little bit. So I open them up. I really opened up those shadows. I, I closed down those highlights. Now I need to go in with the tone enhancer and fix things up and polish things up. It's kind of like that concept of the breaking bone. You break the bone because uh, you need it to grow back better and, and repaired. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, look at my brightness, my overall brightness of the image first, and then I'll go into my shadows and my highlights here. So I'm going to drop my shadows down to close down those those shadows. And, and if, I'll show you what happens here when I turn off this tone enhancer or turn off the HDR look underneath the tone enhancer because what you actually see is that the HDR look brings out some details, some really nice contrasty details in the very small details of our photograph, which are so very important to pull out in the very beginning of this. And let's look at our highlights. Let's bring our highlights up and bring them down. So I'm going to try and I still can't repair those highlights in the back here. I think it's because it's actually editing a JPEG copy instead of the raw copy. Uh, and I'll have to talk to Nathan about that uh, because I'm not sure why those highlights are so bad right now. But um, I'm going to go ahead and, and look at the whites now too. Just bring those whites up and, and those whites down. And basically when I do this, you can look at the histogram and see what happens to the overall image when I, when I boost up my whites. I'm making everything overall more white. And I bring this down and making everything uh, overall more dark because I'm pushing the white point away from the edge of the histogram or pulling that white point closer to the edge of the histogram, making it brighter and more blown out. So you have to be kind of careful that as you move this white point, you don't push it so far over that it clips everything off and makes these really bad uh, clipping uh, areas here. So if I boost up the highlights here, um, it's kind of doing the same thing, but it does it in a much slower, more refined manner where it's almost protecting it from blowing out. It's just kind of taking the whole histogram and shifting it along the uh, the, the, the axis like that. So it's not actually um, 
moving the white point per se, it's grabbing the histogram and moving it closer to the white area or moving it further away from, from the whites and closer to the blacks. And the same thing happens with our shadows here. So just so you know that what's going on in the background of your image, it's important to look at the histogram to make sure we don't have anything blowing out. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and, and play with those a little bit. And let's see about the blacks. Let's just increase our blacks just a little bit, introduce a little bit more there. And then from here, uh, we could increase the detail in the compression, but we already kind of did that with our tone mapping that we did in the HDR look, so I'm not going to worry about that too much. I'm just going to go ahead and drop this uh, down a little bit too. In the curve, if we look at our curve, this bottom portion, this little quadrant here, this is our darkest darks, this is our midtones, and this is our highlights. So what I want to do is I want to bring this curve down a little bit just to darken in uh, some of my dark areas in my photograph, but I want to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, to my highlights, because as I pull that down, you see the curve kind of works together uh, with that black point there. So I'm going to move that back up so that the highlights don't get affected. I just kind of take those shadow areas and make them darker and introduce some more contrast into those shadow areas by using the tone curve. That looks about right right there. So I'm going to go ahead and go into uh, add filter and I'm going to add a tone enhancer, another tone enhancer filter, but this time I'm going to look at this tone enhancer uh, more for a luminosity mask uh, as I do some more editing with this one. So uh, what I'm going to do first is just create a luminance mask. So I'm going to go in here and then right click on that mask and create a luminosity mask. So when we look at this luminosity mask, we don't really know what's being affected on our photograph. But if we right click on it and go to mask view mode and go to grayscale, we can see uh, the areas of, uh, of black are the areas that are not going to be affected and the areas of white are the areas that are going to be affected. So think about this. Like I said before, we were trying to protect our highlight areas, uh, and, and even more so now because those highlights look really bad up there. <laughs> so what I need to do is I need to invert this mask. So if I press this invert button here, that's basically going to say that anything I do with these adjustments right now down here, it's not going to affect my highest highlights. It's only going to affect my midtones and my shadow areas uh, for the most part because all of the areas of the highlight area are black, so they aren't being affected. And how we know this is if we just right click here and we get back out of this, we can go into a red view mode too. The red view mode kind of helps. The O key will toggle that on and off to show you those areas that are being affected. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, look at the contrast in the image as a whole. Notice how as I move the contrast in this adjustment here and as I adjust my shadows, it's not affecting any of those highlight areas because we basically told it to protect a lot of our highlight areas. But if we press that O key and then look at this in the mask view mode, it's not just the highlights that it's protecting. It's protecting our highest highlights into our white areas of our image and moving, progressing into some of our mid-tone areas. So it's a very natural way to adjust our images. Uh, the luminosity masks that have been added uh, recently in here have, have just been wonderful because you get two options. You don't just get the regular luminosity mask. You can invert that luminosity mask to take that luminosity mask to, to levels that uh, you don't normally get by just using the one, okay? So then let's uh, look at our highlights here. And we're right now, if I move the highlights, I'm adjusting the highlights within the uh, basically the shadows approaching the midtones. I'm not actually affecting the highlights in the highlights. So you have to kind of know what you're editing here. If we press O for the OK, just to think about this, if I move the highlight of this image right now, if I move the highlight slider right now, I'm affecting the highlights only of the areas that are looking like a white to a middle gray in this photograph right now because those are the areas that would be affecting by the luminosity mask. It's not affecting our, our true highlights or our whites at all. Okay, so the same thing with our white point here. We're adding a white point to the shadow areas and the mid-tone areas of our image. It's important to keep that in mind because no, no longer do these blacks, whites, highlights, shadows, and contrast deal with the image as a whole. They're dealing with the contrast within the selected area that you're adjusting, which it's, sometimes it can be kind of hard to wrap your head around that. So uh, that's why I always press that O key. Okay, what O key? Okay, okay. <laughs> what are we affecting right now? Well, we're only affecting our midtones and our shadows at this point. So from here, uh, we could introduce some detail in those shadows if we wanted to, but I wouldn't suggest you do that because uh, what we're going to end up getting is some more garish kind of nasty HDR look stuff. So for this image, it doesn't really look that great. So we'll just move on to our next one and go into our color enhancer. 
So I did tone. I did three layers for tone now. So if you notice here, uh, the HDR look, that was the first layer for tone where we actually uh, hit this pretty hard with, um, with, a, with an HDR tone map type of look. We broke the arm. And then with this tone enhancer layer, we took this tone enhancer layer and we, we helped kind of push and pull things around to clean up some of the stuff we did from the HDR look. And then we used this tone enhancer to really work on our shadow areas. So if we turn this uh, check mark off on our HDR look, look at the difference in our image. You know, it's, it's not quite as, as great as what we see in the tone enhancer because we get a lot of the detail happening in this HDR look. I see a lot of what's going on in these areas right here. And it's beautiful, the detail that's happening in that HDR look. Uh, one of the things that we could do right now to protect our waterfall from this HDR look is we could just make a mask here and use our brush and brush out some of the area in the waterfall so that that area does not get affected. So if we press uh, O for, our, for our, uh, our, our view there, we can see that if we brush this out, then these highlight areas are, are not going to be affected by that, by that mask. So I'll probably have to press Alt. If I press Alt, that's going to uh, not let those areas be affected. Those really strong highlight areas there. That'll help us as we go through this and make those area, those highlight areas in that portion of the waterfall look not so bad. Okay, so I'll just kind of hit those a little bit there. If you're ever brushing with the with the brush and it's not doing what you want it to do, press Alt or Option, and Alt or Option will switch it from um, making the, the 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 mask, making the actual mask happen, and adding to it or subtracting from it. So at this point. I'm adding to this mask. So if we press O, that's the area that's now being protected from that, that HDR look. And we'll go ahead and turn these tone enhancers back on because now everything looks a little bit better there in those highlights. Before we move on, some things I just can't look at. I think uh, I'll have to figure out that JPEG thing that's going on here. So I'll go into the color enhancer at this point. We, we modified tone. Now let's go into color because there's some really important things that you have to understand here with color. Um, color can be used to modify color, but color can also be used to modify the tone of a given color. Okay, so now we're getting into uh, more of a color theory basis on things, and there's three properties to any given color in your image. And those properties are hue, uh, that's the color of the color, saturation, the potency of the color, and brightness, the amount of black or white that is in that color. So as we uh, think about those things, we look at all these colors in our images, and you know, in the tone areas there, I wasn't really too concerned about how my image is being affected uh, by my, my tone choices for my color, because I know that I'm just going to go back through and I'm going to clean things up and make things look prettier with my color. So what I'm going to do is just look at my temperature, my overall temperature. I'm going to just increase my temperature a little bit here, maybe introduce a little bit more warmth into this photo. Uh, look at my tint, uh, maybe introduce a little bit more magenta to bring out some of those browns a little bit. Uh, vibrance is good to go there. And then down here, I talked about those three properties, the hue, the saturation, and the brightness, right? Or the hue, saturation, and luminance, as you might be uh, more used to seeing if you're using uh, Photoshop or something of that nature. So. Um, if I were to just bump up this saturation, look what's happening there. Um, it's not a good idea, okay? <laughs> you don't bump up the saturation of the whole image because if you do, you're increasing the, the saturation of every single color over the entire photograph. So all the RGB, CMYK colors are now having their saturation boosted and the potency is overpotent and it's not looking great. One thing I would suggest you do, though, is to look at that saturation. Boost it all the way up just so that you know what colors are present in your image. And when I look at this color, I see that there's quite a bit of yellow, there's some green, there's some orange in here, and there's some blue. And look at where the blue is. The blue is in my waterfall. But there was no blue in my waterfall. That was white water that was hitting the uh, the, the rocks and stuff. But because of the way our our, our cameras operate. You have to think about the way the camera operates. It can only capture one instance of light at a time, and it can really only capture one instance of white balance at a time, or show us one instance of white balance at a time. Now, a lot of that white balance information is contained in the RAW file, which is great because if you're shooting in RAW, then you can typically always go back to that white balance and fix things up. Uh, but think about what's happening in your image with those white balance. In this forest, there's a lot of warmth, okay? But the water portrays a, a relatively cool temperature, so it's reflecting cooler uh, light th that our camera is picking up. So we need to fix that. And the way we do that is we're gonna go into the color range here, and instead of just exploiting all the colors in the image as a whole, we're gonna go into each individual color and play with them accordingly. 
So I'm going to first start off with going into orange because it's one of the colors that's right on the list there. So let's boost up the color orange. When we boost that up, look what happens now. That's actually kind of nice. Uh, maybe not 100%, but just looking at the fact that now we can see, okay, our orange color here is very uh, orange. Do we want it to be more yellow or do we want it to be more red? What color do we want to bring out in that orange? And I always suggest bumping the saturation all the way up so that you know exactly what color you're making that orange look like. And once you find the color that your eye kind of likes, then you can rest on that color. And from there, you can modify your saturation and bring it down. So that as we do this with our, with our image, you can see the color that's starting to come out in those oranges. It's more robust, it's nicer, it's cleaner, it's more beautiful. If you actually were to print this, you're gonna have more of an orangish color happening on those rocks rather than uh, just a dull, bland, boring color, okay? And now we have the brightness of that color. We have the lightness or darkness of that color. Again, it's, sometimes it's a good idea to boost that saturation up to see how light or dark we want that color to be. We can boost up that color to make it a little bit more brighter in that orange area or maybe even make it darker. One thing that I do recommend, if you're gonna increase the saturation really high, one thing I would also recommend is to go into the luminance and maybe come down here and drop your brightness. Now, I, I painted for several years. I was a painter for probably uh, 20 years. I haven't touched paints in a very long time. Uh, but one of the things about being a painter is uh, think of saturation as the color directly out of a tube. And most painters don't actually use a color directly out of a tube. What do they do? They pour it onto a palette. They mix that color with other colors to get the hue that they want from that color that they, they put on their palette. And then they might go in and add a little bit of white or a little bit of black to get the tone of that color the way they want it before they put it on the canvas. It's nothing different than what you're, right, you're doing right now in your photo processing software, okay? So what, what did we do here? Well, we took the orange, we brought it straight out of the tube, and then we mixed a little bit of another color with it, to mixed a little bit of red with it to get that nice red tinge in that orange, and then we looked at the brightness of that orange to say, okay, maybe we need that to be a little bit darker, and now let's taper down the tube ink, or the tube that's coming out of that. I used to be a printmaker too, and we called it paint uh, ink, because <laughs> that's what printmakers use. So sometimes I get ink and paint confused. Um, and then being a photographer, everything just gets confused. So um, just take a look at that. Our oranges look a lot a lot better now in this, in this regard. So I'm gonna just move on down the list. Let's go to yellow. Let's see what happens to our yellow. Let's boost up yellow all the way. Now, when you're looking at a photo like this, I talked about white balance not getting picked up correctly. And if you're ever in a forest, especially uh, in the Oregon coast, there are many different greens that are happening in that forest at the same time. And they're all gorgeous in, in their own uh, light. Uh, no pun intended, but uh, the camera has a hard time picking up the differentiation between those greens, and a lot of times it makes it a flat yellow. So one of the things that your viewer wants to see when they look at your image is green grass or green foliage. So give them green grass and green foliage. Don't give them hyper disgusting, nasty, uh, you know, circus vomit type of green. Give them a, a green that's that looks natural. Okay, so we'll boost that saturation all the way up so that we can look at our yellows and say, okay, yellow, we need you to be a little bit more on the green side. So we're going to bump you up here, and then we're even going to look at the brightness of our color yellow to see if we want that to be a more bright, more fluorescent kind of color, or just darken it down a little bit. So for my taste, I'm just going to bring down the brightness a little bit, and then also bring down that saturation so it's not such a potent form of yellow there. Moving on down the list, let's look at the color green. Uh, here's an interesting thing because a lot of times green doesn't really exist in the color greens. Uh, here in On One, what I like about On One Effects is it actually picks up a lot of the green in that green channel as opposed to mixing it with the yellow like you sometimes see in other uh, programs. Even like Photoshop gets a lot of the greens and the yellows confused. This is where I can go into the color green, bump it up, and maybe make that green look a little bit more on the blue side. Add a little bit of cyan to that. So we're basically rotating that green around the color wheel a little bit, mixing in some more of that cyan color, and then we'll even drop that brightness down a little bit here. And let's look at our before and after here, just with that color enhancement. Look at that. Isn't that, that great? When you just get into that fine detail of our colors, everything just starts to get really nice looking. So move on down the line. Let's go into the color blue. Let's increase the saturation of the color blue. Look, there's actually blue happening in our water, but there's no blue happening in the rest of the photograph. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to go ahead and, and look at that color blue, darken that color blue down a little bit. That's going to help out those highlights a little bit. And then also take the saturation and simply remove it. 
So now we actually don't have the color blue and that color cast happening in our waterfalls. And a lot of times when you're working on waterfalls and you're working on these images, these long exposure images, pay attention to that color blue because you might have blue in your sunset or sunrise if, if you can actually see the sunset or sunrise right now or the sky. So you might not want that to happen to the overall image, the whole image, and then you have to get and do some, some creative masking. But when you're in the woods like this, there's nothing else that's blue in the woods right now. So if I just drop all that saturation out completely, it's now taking that blue tinge and making it white in our waterfall area. So now if I adjust this brightness, you can see I can either increase or decrease uh, the amount of light that's coming off of the blues in the water in our image. And that's a really powerful technique. So I've talked about tone, I talked about color, and if you're taking notes here and you're looking back over your notes, you're thinking, what, what's Blake gonna do next? He's gonna go into artistic effects. And there's three artistic effects that I really do like that are nestled right here in uh, on one effects. And one of those is the glow adjustment. So I'm going to go ahead and add a filter, and I'm going to add a glow layer to this. And I'm going to add a pretty pretty uh, deep glow to this right now that you're probably going to be like, wow, I, I can't believe you're making that high of an amount of a glow on this. But you're going to see what I'm going to do, uh, similar to what I did with the tone enhancer here to kind of polish this up. So what I like about this glow layer is it, it, it makes everything just look much more magical, uh, almost like uh, it's like the refinement of things, you know, where you're taking a, f a photograph and you're taking it out of the realm of photography now and into the realm of artistic effect. Now, if I were to just stop right here, this would be a great photograph that I could call almost technically perfect. Uh, I'm going to beat myself up a little bit more here and talk about those nasty highlights that are blown out. Uh, but I could call this almost technically perfect because I, I did tone, I did color, now I get to move into artistic effects. So what you could do at this point is you could export this out, you could save this file out just the way it is, and then you could move into your artistic effects later. You could break this workflow up a little bit if you're the type that likes to make presets. You can make a preset for your tone and then click on that, make a preset for your color and then click on that and then a preset for your artistic effects. So really don't think about this as um, as I move into this artistic effect, effect realm that, uh, that I'm that this isn't a good photograph right here, okay? I could do some more refining with my tone and color here, but I'm going to move into artistic effects. I like to think about every step of my workflow as being a technical, techni tech, a good technical stopping point. Like if I was a technician of photographs uh, instead of, a, of an artist, um, this would be good from documentation standpoint because it looks very similar to what I saw. But I'm going to move into the artistic realm and a lot of times we have to do that with ourselves. So I'm going to push this glow layer pretty hard. Just like I said, I'm going to push it up pretty hard. And I'm going to change the uh, the blend mode here because right now the blend mode is set to normal. Uh, I want to change this to luminosity so that overall it doesn't affect the color in the image. So this glow layer isn't affecting my color at all. Really, what, oh, the only thing it's affecting now is the tone of my image. That's one thing I'm going to do to protect this photograph from this very powerful glow. But another thing I'm going to do to this photograph to protect it from that powerful glow is I'm going to make another luminosity mask. So I'm going to click on the little plus sign right here, make that mask, right click on it, and go into uh, create luminosity mask. So now when I create that luminosity mask, we have to press O so that we can see what it's affecting. Right now, this is basically saying that this glow is happening on my highlights and it's not happening on my shadows to my midtones. But what happens when we invert it? Anytime you make a, a luminosity mask, I encourage you to invert it. Make it, invert it, and then go back and forth and see what you like best. I tend to really like this look. I like what happens when we take that glow and we apply it to our shadows and we protect our highlights to our midtones. It might be a little overpowering in this photograph, so what I can do is just maybe drop the opacity just a little bit here so that it's not affecting uh, our, our uh, just our, our overall image so hard. So it's not uh, coming in full force, like that full force glow, but we get a lot of that natural kind of highlight painted, almost like it's painted back in with this glow. And that's why I like using the glow this way. And then when we change to that luminosity mask and it protects those highlights so well, uh, it just works It works very well. Another thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to create uh, a vignette. And I like vignettes. Vignettes can be a very powerful tool, but they can also be uh, the detriment to your image too. Um, I like to call vignettes in HDR uh, very similar. Okay, A vignette should be subtle. Your HDR should be subtle. If someone says, oh, you HDR'd that, then you probably did a little too much on the HDR tone mapping. If someone says, oh, you used a vignette, then you probably used too much of a vignette. And if someone says, oh, 
you used a big vignette on a lot of HDR, then you've done two things that should be subtle uh, in too strong of a way. So how I, I like to look at my vignettes, uh, I first like to use this subtle preset that's right here in um, and effects to see what that's going to do for me. But another thing I like to do is drop the brightness all the way down, drop the size all the way down, drop the feather all the way down, and drop the roundness all the way down. What this shows me right now, uh, this shows me exactly where my vignette is going to hit. Okay, So from here, I can almost kind of work things backwards. I can say, okay, I want this vignette to be a little bit more round. How round do I want it to be? Well, that's kind of nice. I kind of like what's happening there. Um, I need this vignette to be feathered, so where am I going to feather it? Well, let's do a nice big feather so that it's very subtle. And now the size, it's a little too big, so how am I going to taper that down? Well, I'm just going to boost this up a little bit here. And what this style of vignette does is if we turn this off, uh, you can definitely tell we used one, but if we turn it on, it's almost one of those things where if I didn't tell you that I used a vignette, you probably wouldn't know um, at all. <laughs> and that's the cool thing about a vignette is that uh, when you use them in a subtle fashion like that, uh, you shouldn't be able to tell that someone used a vignette, but what it should do is it should help narrow the focal point of the viewer into the important parts of the image. So by taking that vignette and putting it around the edges of my image, it's narrowing the viewer's mind into my image, and it's also making anything that's really bright, uh, like the, the line work that's happening in the, uh, in the water, that the, the, that's starting to pop out more. If I turn this off, watch what happens. Well, everything just kind of becomes a, like a chaotic mess around me. But then when I turn this on, it's like, oh, my focal point is being narrowed down into the whites in the image. Because what happens is the viewer is going to rest his eye on areas of highlight first and then move from those areas of highlight around your photograph. So what I've done with this vignette is I've subtly applied it to the rest of the photograph and, and I'm kind of protecting those highlights in a way. I can protect those highlights even further because uh, vignettes are even more similar to HDR in another regard. That if a vignette is applied over an area of highlight, it starts to look like tone compression. So when you're in, H in the HDR mode and, uh, and you maybe, let's say you're in a Photomatix or something like that and, and you put your brackets in there and you ramp up the compression and you have this really bright sky, you notice that your sky goes from bringing a bright white to this like pale yellow, um, nasty kind of almost hay color. That's because what's happening is uh, the information that is there is not there and it's trying to make up that information and that's called tone compression. So that area of white now turns this yellowy, milky-ish color. The same thing happens with our vignettes. When we apply our vignettes over top of our highlights, we're basically telling our highlight areas to become darker, but we did so much work in the tone process to make sure that that didn't happen. So what we need to do is click on this little gear here. Uh, another thing that's hidden, it's, it's really hidden in these, uh, these on one effects areas, if you click on this little gear, this little gear is going to give you your blending options. What it's also going to give you are your protection measures. If you're familiar with something like um, Photoshop and you've played with Blend If, this is very much like Blend If without the confusion because on one is basically saying protect. Protect what? What do you want to be protected from this vignette? Well, if you listen to me for the last three minutes of talking, I talked about the fact that vignettes can make things look pale, milky, nasty, and disgusting when they're applied over top of our, um, of our uh, smooth highlight areas. Okay, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these areas of highlights and I'm just going to protect them. So what's happening now is our areas of highlight are now protected from our vignette. So we can look at our vignette. We uh, drop down all these settings now here and we look at our protection here. We're protecting our areas of highlight. Look at these areas of highlight right here. Those strong areas of highlight are now being protected from our vignette. Those are our highest highlights, so they aren't being protected from our vignette. We can also take it further and start to protect maybe some of our, our mid-tone or our shadow areas. I would say your mid-tones are, are your skin area because skin um, typically is that mid-tone area. So we can protect our mid-tones a little bit from this too so we don't get tone compression in our mid-tones. And then we can go right back down here and look at our feathering, look at our size, look at our roundness, and get that back to where it was with those protection measures in place. It's one thing to hit those protection measures. It's another thing to know exactly what it is that they're doing when you hit them. So one last thing I'm going to do here to really finish this all up is I'm going to use the sunshine uh, filter. So I'm going to go to add filter and I'm going to click sunshine. Now this is a very artistic -y type of look on our image. It's really going to take things uh, to kind of a, an extreme uh, on the punchiness of our image. But I, I kind of like what happens with this sunshine. It's like a glow meets uh, um, meets um, 
uh, saturation a little bit here. So I'm going to exaggerate it here. I'm going to increase this glow quite a bit. I'm even going to increase the saturation quite a bit. Um, I'm going to make this look really bad. and I'm going to make you question why I'm doing it, okay? So I'm just going to bring all this stuff down. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my protection measures. So again, we're breaking this. We're breaking this image and then we're fixing it. Okay, we're going to protect those highlight areas from being affected by this sunshine effect. And then we're going to protect some of our mid-tone areas from being affected by this. And then we're also going to take that a step further. Not only are we going to uh, protect things with our protection measures down here, we're going to go into our mask and then we're going to go and uh, right click on it and create a luminosity mask. So now this sunshine adjustment is very subtly applying itself to our areas of highlight. Again, let's look at what happens when we invert it. Invert it, now our sunshine effect is taking place really strong. Now this sunshine effect is only happening on those highlight areas and really bringing them forward and making them more prominent. So as I said before, we talk about tone, we talk about color, we talk about artistic effects. Are these tone and, and color things important. Let's just turn them off. Let's turn them off and see what happens if we just had the glow and the vignette and the sunshine effect. It's not as good. But what happens when we work backwards and we add that color enhancer back in and then start adding that tone enhancer back in? You see, this is a build-up process. You know, the whole, the, the image building as a whole can't always be um, a click for a preset or the click of a magic button to make the image look better. Let's look at our before. Here is our overall before image right out of Enhance, and here's our after. We've gone from more of almost like a snapshot type of look to a, uh, a more refined artistic style look with the uh, image that we have now after looking at our tone, our color, and artistic effects. So like I said before, you don't have to do these things in this order. Uh, if you're in effects, some of the best tone enhancement layers are obviously going to be your HDR look. They're also going to be your tone enhancer look. Even the black and white can be used as a tone enhancement also. And then we go into color. We go into the color enhancer. We use the color enhancer. That's a great one for color. But sunshine also brings about some color. But when I'm talking about the tone and color aspects, remember, I'm talking about the technical aspects. The best technical aspects for tone and color that you have in, in, in effects are the tone enhancer and the color enhancer. And then you can move on to those artistic effects by adding those glows, the vignettes, the sunshines, maybe the vintage look. Uh, the sky is really the limit at this point. If you wanted to save this out as a preset, you very well could do that. But the, the only problem that you would have with that is that any of the masking that you've done on here won't be saved on that preset, even the luminosity mask. So keep that in mind, that if we were to save this out as a preset, it might look good as a preset. But keep in mind that we might have to look at some of the masking on that to make sure that we don't affect certain things. So at this point, I'll go ahead and open it up to uh, questions. If uh, you've seen any good ones coming through there, Nathan, I'm more than happy to answer. Definitely. There's been a lot of questions coming in, Blake. Um, can you, <laughs> uh, the first one is, can you discuss, um, uh, John would like to know if you can discuss how to process long exposure Milky Way images. I don't know if you have any experience with that, Blake, but I'll put you on the spot. Okay. No, that sounds great. Uh, well, you know, I guess it depends on the, the long exposure of the Milky Way again, because sometimes uh, I've done a, quite a bit, not not a whole lot. I've, I've edited a couple uh, Starry Night Skies, and basically what I found there is that you have to pay a lot of attention to tone in regards to tonal noise, because a lot of times what happens with that uh, Milky Way with those long exposures is the black area starts to turn into noise, and you get confusion as to what um, what exactly is happening with the uh, the stars in the background, or what's a star and what's noise, okay? So you have to really pay attention to that. Um, a lot of that depends on the sensor of your camera, the type of camera that you're using, uh, whether your sensor can handle higher ISOs, the ISOs that you need to do to go maybe, because if you, sometimes with the Milky Way, if you go like 30 seconds, you can almost start to get star trails. So you don't necessarily want to go to the 30 second realm with that. And also depends on, there's a lot of things it depends on, whether the lens that you're using, the focal lengths and all the other things that kind of go into that. But um, when it comes to actually editing it, you have to pay attention to the tone of specifically on your darks, I would say, because you have to um, know that anything that you punch up in those dark areas, you're going to be bringing about more noise with it. So I tend to stay on the darker side of those and really bring out those highlight areas in those stars as well. And then when you're actually editing the Milky Way, you got to get really creative with your color enhancement because uh, that's where you might only mask out 
just for that Milky Way to punch up some of those purples and those magentas and those blues. And like I showed you before in this one, it's no different. Just like here, I, I knocked down the blues to get the blue out of the long exposure areas. I also punched up the greens to make the greens more punchy in those areas. You could make a selective mask just for those uh, the Milky Way, and that will give you that... Um, the, the, the nice purples and the glowing colors that happen in that Milky Way. Definitely. A lot of people are wondering if this is being recorded and if it's going to be posted later. And the answer is yes, it will be. So it's being recorded. It will be posted to the On One YouTube channel as well as to onone.com slash blog. And uh, the next question is came a little bit earlier, Blake, when you were talking about your camera settings. Uh, it says you were shooting an aperture priority and changing the ISO and the apertures. Can you explain a little bit more about your choices? And wouldn't it be simpler to shoot in speed priority instead? Yes, uh, I guess, you know, it really comes down to, like, the, the personal decisions that you choose when you're on the scene. You know, for me... Um, I do spend a lot of time in aperture priority mode. I also spend a lot of time in manual mode. Um, and I ask myself these questions. Um, I say, what do I need to do to get more or less light? I'm less focused on um, my settings that I'm in, per se, and more focused on, OK, if I double this, I'm going to get two times as much light. If I um, half it, I'm going to get less, uh, especially when I'm doing long exposure stuff. Because you know you can pull out your long exposure calculators, and you can say, OK, well, if you're at this, and, and you're at this ISO, and you're at this, and this, and this, by this calculator, I should have to go at this exposure, and everything's going to be perfect. Well, it's not always the case. Um, and, and when you're trying to capture that personality, sometimes it's less about the technical side of things and just knowing your camera enough to say, okay, what's going to give me more or less light? What's going to give me more or less time? And adjust your camera accordingly. So for me, um, I, I know the limitations of my camera, and I know that if I go to something like ISO 1600, the noise is going to be uh, minimal at best because of the sensor that I have. So I'm not too concerned with that. I know the constraints of my camera, so I'm less worried, I guess, about my settings being right and just getting the picture right. And if I have to just bump up the ISO to do that or, or move the, the aperture or move the shutter speed, I just kind of do the combinations. You know, um, I, I guess it's less of a technical approach, <laughs> and it's probably not the magical answer that anybody wanted to hear. But really, um, I spent a lot of time in the very beginning of being a photographer uh, looking at other people's um, settings on their cameras and questioning why they did those things. And, and then I would go back onto the scene and I would try to emulate what they were doing with their apertures and their shutter speeds and stuff. And I would get really frustrated because I thought that there was a calculated move to it. But once I moved away from the calculations of things and started to focus on the fact that if I move my, uh, my ISO from 100 to 200, well, I'm getting double the amount of light. So that's going to speed up my, my shutter speed. Once I started to think about the, the terms of doubling and halving, um, I, I focus less and less on the technicalities of things and more about just getting the, the look of the image that I want. Sometimes it's about capturing that personality of the uh, streaky water like you see here. Awesome. Yeah, a lot of really good questions coming in, Blake. The next one comes from Ioannos, and it's he says, or she says, I'm sorry, histogram shows very dark shadows. How do you deal with that during printing? Uh, yeah, it does show very dark shadows here. And, you know, on, on the, the, the realm of, um, you know, looking good for screen and looking good for print, they're two totally different things. And at this point, this is probably pushed way too far in those dark areas. If you even look at the histogram, it's really encroaching on some of these dark areas as being areas that could be considered um, blowouts or uh, clipping, I guess, blowouts on the highlights, clippings on the shadows, you know, whatever you want to call them. But um, what I would do is I would really pay attention to that for print. And if this is something that I did want to print, I would be cognizant of the fact that some of those areas in those dark pits are going to come out as pure ink black, and that's not going to look that great. So um, in that regard, I'd probably spend a little bit more time in the tone areas and make sure that those areas aren't being uh, 
are, aren't being pushed to that extreme. I might even go into some of those protection measures that you see in those and protect more of my shadow areas from that happening so that those areas don't go to pitch pure black ink. Same thing on the clipping side, making sure that things don't go to paper white by being clipped off on the white area. Um, but those are more um, technical to be based off of what you're doing for print, what you're doing for the screen. And sometimes with the screen, you can actually get away with uh, just a little bit more of that black area and those dark areas. Uh, but good question because when you do go to print, uh, you do have to be very cognizant of paper white and ink black. Great. This question's about uh, Yosemite itself. Um, Bob would like to know if their long drought has affected the water amount um, this June. I don't know if you can answer that or not, Blake. I was just there in May, and uh, the long drought might have affected it, but I'm telling you, these waterfalls were dumping so fast and so hard that, um, you know, when we were there in May, even the the um, the park uh, attendee that we were talking the uh, the ranger, yeah, we were talking to the park ranger a lot before we went to make sure all of our permits were up to speed and everything, and uh, she even told us you're going at the best time because we haven't had this much water dumping from the falls in about four years, so uh, I'm not sure how they're looking now in June and July, but in May. These things were dumping so fast, and even these waterfalls here that you, you see in Lewis Creek, these waterfalls uh, typically are a lot smaller uh, based off of what the guy the, that we rented the uh, condo from was telling us that these waterfalls were, were pushing pretty hard too because of the amount of water that was coming off of the uh, the mountains there in, in Yosemite. So, I mean, we had a good day. We had a very we had a very good five days there because the water was going like crazy. That was in. Uh, you couldn't even get close enough to Bridal Veil vale Fall to take a picture without your entire camera getting soaked. That's how much water was there. So it didn't affect it in May, but how is it looking in June and July? Nah, I'm not quite sure about that. If I lived close enough to there, I'd probably go back because it was almost frustrating shooting there with that much water dumping down. Yeah, we got some very good shots with those sweeping landscapes with those waterfalls happening everywhere. It looked like something out of a fairy tale. But then when you get up close to them, you, if you weren't wearing a raincoat, you came out soaked. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. We've got time for one more question, I think. Um, and this one comes from Michael. Did you meter the water and work around that reading, or did you just use the matrix metering and set the exposure? Uh, usually when I when I meter, I'm usually in uh, more paying attention to, to things in the scene. This image, I think, probably came from a bracketed exposure, uh, a series of bracketed exposures that I pulled it from. Um, and at that point, I try not to blow out my highlights too much. Um, like I said with this one, I'm not quite sure why this happened with the water in that waterfall like that because I, I edited the exact same photograph. Um, and you can even see, I'll show you my notes over here. I edited the exact same photograph um, in uh, in, in effects before, and I didn't have those, you know, horrible bad blowouts there. So I'm usually metering for those to ensure I don't have that. But for some reason, I didn't want to stop the webinar and have a technical difficulty, so I just kept pushing on. Uh, but typically, uh, I do meter so that things aren't blown out in those highlight areas because, like I said, with the shadows, I can kind of recover those areas pretty well with those sensors. So I definitely don't want a blown out highlight uh, because if I get pure white, there's no recovering from it. But if you get pure black, um, you know, you can always make it print to paper black, and it doesn't always look that bad, you know, from an artistic standpoint, maybe not from a technical standpoint, but from an artistic standpoint. Yeah, great. We were getting so much good feedback, Blake. A lot of people all around the world, from the UK, we've got people in Washington, New York, Idaho, and uh, one gal even says, Mary says, Blake explains things so well, glad you have him on, and, and so am I, and I appreciate you coming on, Blake. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. I really do appreciate it.